Many Atlantis enthusiasts think that the submerged Azores Plateau is the most likely location for the sunken land described by Plato. In order for this to be true, the Azores Plateau would have had to have been above water during the last part of the last ice age. Randall Carlson claims there is good evidence for that. But we can make a very strong case that a large section of the Azores Plateau was above sea level during the late glacial maximum. Randall Carlson is simply wrong. Randall Carlson is a self-taught independent researcher who is interested in identifying the cataclysms and catastrophes that have affected our planet and the people on it. He is familiar to many of us who are interested in pseudoscience and pseudoarchaeology because of his close relationship with Graham Hancock. He talks about a lot of stuff, and he talks a lot, but Atlantis is one of his favorite subjects. Carlson pinpoints the Azores Plateau as the most likely location of Plato's Atlantis. This is not an original thought, as the plateau is in about the right spot. The Azores Plateau was identified in the first half of the 20th century as detailed mapping of the Atlantic Ocean floor got underway. It is a raised chunk of land submerged about 2,000 meters below the current sea level. There are large mountains, some of which rise above sea level, to comprise the Azores Islands. So, the Azores Plateau is in the right spot, and it's currently underwater. Both of those things check out for being Plato's Atlantis. But in order for the Azores Plateau to be Atlantis, it would have had to have been above water 11,600 years ago, when Plato said Atlantis was destroyed. I've listened to many of Carlson's videos over the last week. One of the main pieces of evidence he uses to support the plausibility of the Azores Plateau being above water 11,600 years ago is this. They say here the Atlantis cruiser and Great Meteor Seamounts rise from a broad ridge or plateau which extends from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Um, so about a ton of flat pteropod limestone cobbles was dredged from the summit area of one of these sunken what they're calling the sea mounts. And a sea mount is like a flat top mountain, right? Like the top of the mountain has been sheared off, okay? So they pulled up these limestones, right? These limestone cobbles, they dated them. One of the cobbles gave an apparent radiocarbon age of 12,000 years, plus or minus 900 years. The state of lithification, how, how much it is turned into rock, of the limestone suggests that it may have been lithified under subaerial conditions. In other words, in the atmosphere. That's what that means. It may have been lithified under subaerial conditions, and the seamount may have been an island within the past 12,000 years. Wow. He talks about this a lot. Let's get back to looking at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Now, 19 He's talking about these particular seamounts, which are named the Atlantis. So somebody decided that they were going to name this sunken mountain Atlantis, which does seem appropriate. Cruiser. And the third one um, is called the Great Meteor Seamount. The Great yeah. Meteor, right? It's like somebody knew what they were doing when they were naming those. Hey, get this. One of the cobbles gave a radiocarbon age of 12,000 years. Uh. And that the Seamount may have been an island within the past 12,000 years. <laughs> it's crazy, Ali, that, that, that the geologists are like, well, there's no evidence of any island there. They say that, and yet here, here we are, these people in the 50s basically Duh. Say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's crazy that this, I mean, these guys were doing science. Oh, why, yeah. Why was it thrown out? Is there any... Is it just totally ignored? So that dude at the end asks a good question. So let's look. Let's first find the original paper that Carlson is referencing. If we follow the reference and go to volume 65 of the 1954 Geological Society of America Bulletin, we see that the page numbers end at 1224. The paper is referenced as being on page 1261. If we go to the issue and scroll down to the bottom, we can confirm that the paper doesn't exist there. There is no page 1261. So what's going on? It turns out that other people have been stymied trying to find this paper. Uh, I found this exchange online where someone wrote to the Geological Society and received a message saying that the paper was actually an abstract of a presentation to the 1954 Geological Society annual meeting in Los Angeles. That's a red flag. Those of us who live in the academic world know the difference between a presentation and a paper. You can say almost anything you want in a presentation if there's no review process. You could give a presentation claiming the moon was made of cheese. There's no reviewers to say, hold up, wait a second, how do you know that? Abstracts are short, and they don't contain the details you really need to evaluate a claim. 
But in this case, the abstract is all we've got. Heeson and his colleagues never published a full paper on this topic. So the abstract is what the abstract is. So what does it say? The abstract gives us three key pieces of information about the rocks that were dredged up from the top of the seamount. Number one, the rocks are pteropod limestone. Number two, that limestone was possibly lithified in the atmosphere. And number three, one of the rocks returned a radiocarbon age of about 12,000 years. So anyone who has had Archaeology 101 should immediately spot another red flag. The radiocarbon date of 12,000 years came from a rock. Radiocarbon dating works on organic material. Living things take in carbon from the atmosphere while they are alive. The atmosphere contains both stable and unstable isotopes of carbon. Unstable isotopes, like carbon-14, are continually decaying. When an organism dies, the stable carbon isotopes in the organism remain, but the unstable isotopes continue to decay. The more time passes, the less carbon-14 remains. A radiocarbon lab will compare the proportions of the stable and unstable carbon in a sample and give you an age estimate with an error term. In this case, the age estimate was 12,000 years, plus or minus 900 years. So what does that age estimate of 12,000 years actually mean? If, and this is a big if, the date actually reflects the age of the rock, that means that the creatures that made up the rock were actually alive 12,000 years ago. They were swimming around in the ocean 12,000 years ago, and then they died, and then their bodies sank and became incorporated in the limestone that is formed underwater. The abstract specifies that this is a marine limestone made of pteropods. All right, here's the bottom of the ocean. This ruler is sea level. So there's a magma vent there. Forms an underwater volcano. Uh, the sea level drops. The wave action here, when the sea is here, shears off the top of our volcano. So that's all gone. That gives it a flat top. Sea level rises again. Should put some waves there. There's sea level. All your little pods and other things that are living their happy lives here 12,000 years ago. They die. The ones that land up here start forming layers that get compressed in the undersea environment, and that turns into your green limestone. Now, uh, if the radiocarbon date is accurate, these things are dying 12,000 years ago. If the other part of the story is accurate, that this was once above water, then that sea level has got to come back down again after 12,000 years ago. So what you have actually is the exact opposite scenario that we have with the Atlantis story. We've got the limestone being formed underwater at 12,000 years or so ago and then coming up above the water after that rather than submerging. So overall this makes no sense. But, in reality, the date probably doesn't reflect the age of the limestone at all. It probably reflects the age of some organic material on or in the limestone, something else that died and sank onto the rocks. Now, those radiocarbon pioneers back in the late 1940s and early 1950s weren't dummies. But all that we know about the sample is what's presented in the abstract, a rock dated to 12,000 years ago. Radiocarbon dating was brand new when this work was done. Carbon-14 was discovered in 1940, and Willard Libby proposed using it for dating in 1946. Heason was out mapping the floor of the Atlantic Ocean and collecting samples in 1947 and 1948. This was all brand new. It was standard practice for radiocarbon labs to publish their dates in the early days of the method. I searched the early issues of the journal Radiocarbon to see if I could find out more about the 12,000-year date. I homed in on the Lamont Geological Observatory, which is mentioned in the abstract. I found in Lamont Labs seven publications of the radiocarbon dates from 1951 through 1961. I was not able to find a date that matched the 12,000-year date, but I did find this description and a date that's obviously from the same 1947-1948 expedition, reported in 1959. This sounds like a different sample than the one Heason describes, but without more specifics we really don't know. But if we're going to uncritically accept the 12,000-year date in the abstract with no further information as indicating that the seamount was above water at the end of the Ice Age, then we should also accept this later date as indicating that the seamount was above water in 6600 BC. Of course, that doesn't jive with the Atlantis story, so cue the crickets. The bottom line is that we really don't know what the 12,000-year date is dating. So, returning to this guy's question. Are there any... Is it just totally ignored? That's the really interesting historical part of this story. It turns out that Heason didn't accept the theory of plate tectonics in the late 1940s as those early expeditions were underway. A 1948 National Geographic article about the expedition written by Maurice Ewing states that what they were finding seemed to be in direct contradiction to the expectations of the theory of plate tectonics. 
It was only after Heason's colleague Marie Tharp turned Heason's raw data into detailed maps of the ocean floor that it became apparent that there was a rift system in the mid-Atlantic, just like the ones visible on land in Africa. Tharp wasn't allowed to go on the expeditions because she was a woman. Her work convinced Heason that plate tectonics was real. Heason and Tharp published a landmark map of the floor of the Atlantic Ocean in 1957, and in the late 1950s and early 1960s, Heason and Tharp wrote popular and professional articles arguing strongly for plate tectonics. Circling back to the question, it appears to me that Heason himself simply lost interest in investigating whether or when the seamounts were above water in the recent past. I think it's likely that he realized that his original conjecture was wrong and didn't make a whole lot of sense, and it paled in importance to all of the pieces falling into place with plate tectonics. The radiocarbon date was never published, and the seamounts fell far down in his priority list. And as for why one of the seamounts is named Great Meteor, oh, that was the name of the ship that discovered it. And it turns out the Great Meteor seamount has been highly studied since then. It has a volcanic core topped by 150 to 600 meters of carbonate rock, limestone, and a layer of sand. The flat top was formed when waves sheared off the top of the volcanic mountain during the late Miocene to the Pliocene, that is, between about 12 and 2.6 million years ago. Limestone was formed and sand was deposited during the Pliocene and Pleistocene, but the surface was probably never above water in the Pleistocene. The highest points of the Great Meteor Seamount are about 275 meters below the surface. The summit of the Atlantis Seamount is about 265 meters below surface. If the summit of Great Meteor was never above water during the Pleistocene, it is very unlikely that the summit of the Atlantis Seamount was above water either. Carlson's claim that there is a very strong case to be made for the Azores Plateau being above water in the late Pleistocene has other elements besides this date which I will have to address in other videos. But one leg of his claim rests firmly on this 12,000-year date, this single very dubious radiocarbon date on a piece of limestone. There's also a lot of pretty faulty logic in what seems to be a complete disregard for a lot of science out there that contradicts his desire to have these seamounts poking above water at the right time to be part of Atlantis. I'm not at all convinced by what I've heard so far. You're going to have to do a lot better than a story built around an undocumented radiocarbon date from a rock pulled from somewhere in the ocean in 1948 to pull this one off. Cue the sad trumpet. I don't really know how to end this. I tried to be nice. <laughs> I did my best. <laughs>